So my name is uh, Mishko Hebri. I work for Google. Um, I do a lot of stuff with testability and give a lot of talks on it. But anyways, uh, this is something that uh, I he hesitate to call a library or a framework because a library in my world is something that you call when you want to get some work done, right? And a framework is something that calls you. And this is neither. This is actually what I would consider a better web browser. And uh, the best way to describe what this is is it's what a web browser would have been if it was designed for web apps. So let me uh, give you a little demo, and then maybe we'll get to some slides. So everybody always does a Twitter client. Since I work for Google, I do, do a Buzz client. So here's a Buzz client in uh, 46 lines of code. If you hit fetch, and if uh, Google will be so kind to reply to our JSON P request, we will see some stuff coming. There we go. We'll see the tweets for the Google Buzz team. And when you hit uh, the expand replies, you'll see the replies. So it's standard issue stuff, right, that you've seen millions of times. So how does this work? So the first thing is you have your, uh, a div tag. And what the div tag wants to do is it wants to say, hey, there's this thing called the buzz controller. And the buzz controller is just a class. Oh, by the way, you can just cut and paste the whole thing into your browser, and it will just work. There's no server-side component, no pre-compilation, no nothing like that. So um, we have an input. So we have the buzz controller, which runs the show. That's your uh, controller. And we have an input, which is the, in this case, a user ID and has the default value to it. And there's a button that says fetch. Now, this fetch is tied to the fetch method over here. And the first thing I want you to notice is that we're fetching all the activities. And for those of you guys who've done plenty of JavaScript, should say, hey, this is an XHR. Where is our callback, right? So where is our callback? Well, there isn't one. Um, and the way it actually works is that the activity returns a, a future that is, you know, at some point in time, I promise to give you the object. In the meantime, I'm just going to give you an a empty array. So you get back an empty array over here, and because all you want to do is display to the UI, the activity at some point returns and then populates your array, which then uh, creates a, there's an ng repeat tag in here, which simply says, take the activities, oops, take the activities and repeat over them. There we go. Uh, where did I lose myself? Take the activities, repeat over them, and then stamp out the divs. Now, this may seem like a templating library, but there's one fundamental difference, and that is that the array you get back is live, which means that if you add items to that array, it will cause the repeater to add new divs. And if you subtract items from the array, it will cause the repeater to extract divs back out. So it's a live data binding, unlike you know, most templating systems where you have to do the merge, and every time you modify your model, the, uh, the, the view kind of goes stale, and you have to call some code to remerge it. And then if you have, a, you have a problem that if user might have had an input field that they modified, you need to first extract the data out of the input field, put it back in your model, remerge it, and then redo the update. So what this does is it changes the way you look at the app, and it says, well, there's actually one thing, and that is that the model is the real source of truth. Uh, does that kind of make sense? How old is? Okay, so, so it's a very fundamentally different way of thinking about this. So uh, now that I give you a little bit of demo, let me show you why. Uh, so, oops, this is a little too big. There we go. So uh, HTML, we all know, was language designed in 89, but it was four documents, and the scripting came in about 95. I'm just going to go through a little faster. And what was amazing about this is that Given the fact that web apps were all about documents, uh, we were still able to build these crazy apps in 2005 with, with basically JavaScript in this document-centric world. And so uh, while Gmail and, and Google are just an examples of oh, Ajax Web 2.0 apps, that really shows that despite being the wrong model, uh, people have managed to do amazing things. So we're 2011. and you know, HTML and JavaScript have improved significantly, but the level of abstraction is basically the same we had back in 89, which is that it's document-centric, not web app-centric. And so, you know, you can say, well, there's all these other things that already solved this problem. Well, let me categorize them into three categories. I think they all do a wonderful job in what they're trying to achieve. But really, we, we can break this up uh, saying, you know, I'm a library that treats the browser as a dumb terminal, and then I'll just simply do a round trip 
on every click. That's one kind of set of applications. Uh, the other kind of set of libraries or frameworks, they basically take the approach, you know, HTML and JavaScript is just too complex and CSS and all these pieces, so we'll just abstract away all the HTML and JavaScript away from you so you don't have to deal with it. And the last group is what I would call DOM manipulators, which is, you know, the API kind of sucks in the, in, in the, in the, in, in, in browsers, it's inconsistent, et cetera, and we'll give you a better API for it. Uh, but nobody's really attacking the problem of like, well, what would, the browser, what would the browser should look like if it was really meant for building web apps? It's a completely different question. So what I love about a browser is that it's declarative. I can say, hey, hello world. And to do the same exact thing, this equivalent hello world in pure JavaScript, you get something like this. Now, this looks pretty ridiculous, right? I mean, it's just hello world. And the reason why it's so complicated is because, well, this IE is different. And then we can't just get a hold of something. We have to wait for a attach event, right? Do we have to wait for the browser ready before we can modify it? So you guys all seen this thing, right? And you can't just write in the same way because different browsers have different API. So this is what adds the complexity that we're trying to avoid. And there is fabulous libraries out there like jQuery that kind of hide this away and say, hey, I can do hello world in something as simple as that. But I still have to understand the concept of being DOM unready, the concept of having DOM nodes and getting references to them and then modifying them and changing them. And, and I'm really trying to get away from me having to have references to DOM because that creates coupling between the presentation logic and, and the view. So what really I would like to be able to say is say, hey, greeting equals hello world, and say, put the greeting right over there. Now, for those of you who've been coding for a while, say, hey, that's a bad idea. You're putting logic into your template. And I agree with you. So a better, more canonical way of doing this is to say, I have a class called greeting. The class exposes a property called greeting, and then this thing just renders. And what I like about this example, and by the way, this is actual Angular code you're looking at and this actually runs in the browser, is that it's declarative, right? Instead of telling imperatively the browser how to wait for events and what DOM element to get a hold of, et cetera, you simply are declaring, hey, here is a piece of HTML, and I want this HTML to be controlled by a particular controller, and the controller might have some kind of a model, and this is how the model should be projected to the user. So uh, let's do a, if you want to build an app, you, you need to do three, uh, Three things. You need to be able to uh, modify the DOM. You need to be able to read the inputs. And you need to be able to do XHR, right? If you can do those three things, you can fundamentally build any kind of app you want. So uh, let's say I have a simple thing where I wanted to type something in here, and it, it outputs. So this is how you would do it in jQuery. And the, the key thing to notice here is that I have to get a hold of the, the references to both the name and the greeting. And um, furthermore, there's this caveat over here, um, which basically says, oh, if the key down events come, I can't read it just now because I would intercept the, the browser's default event handler hasn't run yet, so I have to do set timeout zero so that the browser updates the text field with the key, and then in the future at set timeout, right? Have you, have you guys done this? Like, you guys should be all familiar with this craziness, right? It's not very declarative. It's not what I want to tell the browser to do. What I want to tell the browser is, look, uh, this name over here is the same thing as this name over here. And so when I type, notice it actually executes and runs. And by the way, this, is, this presentation here is actually done in Angular, and that's why all these live uh, samples kind of work. So that's the kind of declarative nature that I'm looking for from a browser. So here's another example. If you wanted to choose uh, the kind of greeting you want and type over here, again, more extra getting references to. And every time you have a reference to the DOM, you're actually uh, making it more difficult to test your code. How many of you guys have this experience that too many references just makes the testing miserable? So I'll talk about testing in a second. Uh, but basically, these tricks uh, that you have to do and all this extra stuff you have to do as timeouts, et cetera, and the fact that the whole thing really isn't declarative, rather it's, it's very imperative when you do an application, and yet, the browser and HTML is all about the declarative nature of it is the, the thing that we would like to address. So again, the same exact situation. In Angular, you simply say the salutation here is the same thing as the salutation over here, and the name is the same thing as name, and you can think of it as a spreadsheet-like live bindings kind of events. 
So are we saying that jQuery sucks? Absolutely not. jQuery is absolutely awesome, but for DOM manipulation, right? And so the question is, building apps is just a lot more than DOM manipulation. You know, DOM manipulation is a small part of it. It's the stuff that is the this is the boring stuff, the, t the boilerplate of what you have to do when you want to build a web app. So the question is, can't we do better? Um, so what Angular does is it increases the level of abstraction. And it does so not because it tells you you will follow the set of APIs or because it gives you a different library API. It simply kind of augments the browser so that it can do better things. And you can express yourself in a very declarative manner. So let's do one more example, which is XHRs. That's the last piece you need when you talk to um, the server. So this one, I think, if you push greet, it talks to the server, and the server randomly responds with a particular greeting. And uh, what you want to do is simply say, hey, this is my div. It's controlled by this particular uh, controller. Uh, here's my name. And if I click on the greet, call the greet method, and uh, I'm going to do the greeting. So here's the controller about it. The thing I want you to notice is a couple of things. First of all, there are no references to DOM. Right? This makes testing this super easy. You simply say new greeter in your test. Um, you call the greet method, and you assert that the name uh, or the greeting is the proper thing. The second thing I want you to notice is, hey, what is this XHR? So I'm not sure if you have this experience, but when you test code, uh, XHR is troublesome. You have to jump through all these complicated hoops where you have to replace the jQuery's global XHR with a fake XHR so you can, may have a mock. And then you can assert that the XHR got cold, and then you can pretend that the right data comes back, and all this stuff. So we wanted to make sure that not only do, does Angular have a story about the declarative nature of it, but also has dependency injection built in. I believe somebody was presenting Wire.js yesterday. I'm not sure who it was. Um, and that's basically the same exact idea. And I have to look into it to see if it could be integrated. Uh, but we have the concept of services. And one of the services is XHR. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that when you are testing your system, you can also include, there's an extra JS file that we provide. It provides the mocks. So what you get back out of it is, um, you get back a, uh, a mock automatically because dependency injection knows that you're in test mode and that you probably want to get a mock in injected in there instead. Um, so documents don't need to be tested. The web apps do. I kind of already mentioned that. And so I think a, 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 your JavaScript code or library, or whatever you want to call it, should, not, should just not just have a story in terms of how I do things, but also a story of how exactly is this thing going to be tested. Um, and having both a unit testing story and an end-to-end -end story is, I think, super important. So what Angular does is really takes care of all the DOM manipulation. So in your application, you get to worry about implementing the behavior, and you leave the, the, the DOM manipulation to the, to the set of uh, directives inside of the HTML that you simply say, this is how you transform the model into the view. Um, so I'll just skip around because this is a slide for something longer. The other piece that we have in services is, for example, routes. For those of you who are Ruby and Rails developers, you should be all familiar. You simply define, you know, if the URL says this, then this is the controller and this is the template to load. You have your partials, your views, and all that good stuff, uh, which makes bookmarking and deep linking and all that good stuff uh, really trivial to do. Um, so. And this is uh, the example that I kind of already showed, the idea of resources, how a future gets returned, and then in the future point in time, you can, uh, uh, the, the data banning kind of takes care of itself. So, oh, the other thing is validation, for example. So if this thing says it has to be an email. So that's an email, and you can see that the, it's no longer invalid. But if I, so we have, the validation is something that should really be a browser level thing, not um, something that a developer has to add. And notice it's very declarative in nature. So because it's declarative, uh, you can add behavior to it, and you don't have to put all this stuff inside of your, inside of your application. Uh, we also have the concept of filters. So this is interesting. So for example, this one says that the items, so, or rather you can think of it as projections. So you have a model. model could be a list of things. In this case, it's an empty array. So an empty array gets rendered as nothing, but if I say uh, jsconf, then I have one item inside of the array which produces a one list item, right? Because there's a repeater over the items. And if I do a, a comma here, and then, I don't know, node.js, 
it produces a next item in the list. That's uh, because the, the projection between the string that's in here and the underlying data model says it's a list, so it splits it on commas, uh, and then it creates a, uh, then you can, because it's a list, you can iterate over it and produce different items. So basic things such as this are kind of taken care of for you. Uh, now let me show you the next step. So when people first come to Angular, they say, oh, it's a templating system, which is kind of an understatement, but actually it's not. What it is is a HTML compiler. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that you can make your own tags in HTML that didn't exist before. Why would you want to do that? Because it gives the, the, your designers tools that are high level. So in this particular case, let's say you wanted to have a current time inside of your, your browser, but the actual time actually, as you can see, it changes. It's, it's the current time in reality it is. So what you want to do in HTML is simply say my time and specify the format by which it, it should be rendered. Now, browsers don't understand this unless you have some crazy pre-compilation step on a server. Uh, but with Angular, because everything that happens in the browser, what you do is you tell Angular that there is a uh, there's, a, there's a, um, a directive that says, if you come across an HTML tag called my time, what I want you to do is uh, uh, show the current date, uh, you know, and this is a tick that happens every one second, and it updates it automatically. What that allows you to do is you can build up a rich DSL, right, a rich domain-specific language for building other things. So if you find yourself that in your UI you oftentimes have to do Twitter widget or a date picker or something like that, you can wrap it and you can then let the developer, uh, the designer of the website be free to move things around and have higher level directives that, which are not available uh, in, in core HTML. So uh, HTML JavaScript uh, will be around for many more years and so what we would like to do is have a solution that embraces these things rather than um, says, hey, you know, HTML, CSS doesn't really work, and so we are abstracting them away. And, there, you know, and I mentioned that earlier, there's two ways of abstracting it away, which basically says, you know, you'll code against this API, which makes it hard to create new HTML structures for it, or you treat it as a DOM terminal. And again, that's not exactly what we want. What we want is just take the HTML and CSS by the horns and say, yeah, this is how it was meant to be. Uh, so let me show you other steps. So we, we, I mentioned testability. And so uh, let's pull up. Actually, the documentation itself is an Angular application, so we can do searching easily. Uh, actually, let's do, let's do filter. So let me show you a particular uh, function. Uh, we call this the type augmentation. So basically, here's a list of phone numbers. And as I type Mary, it will only show Mary. Now, uh, this is something that's relatively, not, not hard, but it's not trivial to do in most systems because as I type, I have to listen and then I have to add and remove items inside of a table. The way this is done in Angular is that you have your, your model defined over here, you have your search text over here, and then there's a, there's a type augmentation called a filter that goes on array. So because friends is an array, it, it magically has a method filter. This is not done through prototypes, so don't freak out. Um, and then you can type the text over here. And what's happening is this is returning a different array that contains only those items that have the particular text. And then the repeater automatically adds and removes rows inside of the table to get the effect. So it's very easy to do things spreadsheet-like. But we had troubles that our demos, in which are, this is the documentation, the demos were also breaking all the time. So we also made a little test case that says this is how we prove that the code actually works. So you can say, hey, take an input, you know, enter some text in it, and then verify that the repeater should have so many columns in it, et cetera. So not only do we have a good unit testing story where you can just instantiate your individual controllers, and because there's no DOM, it's relatively easy, but we also want to have an end-to-end -end testing story. So what we want to do is we want to execute all of the documentation pages. And this is actually the documentation verifying itself that all of the examples inside of the documentation are actually doing what the tests say it should be doing. Uh, you can see Buzz again being a little slow, uh, but you can see how it, it, it visits every single page and then it runs the individual tests and you can see the individual items that were run inside of it. Now what's cool about this, uh, let me just go back to, so it doesn't kill my CPU. What's cool about it is if I go back to uh, resource, and, and this is the demo basically says, 
um, go find the fetch button, click it, and then verify that the repeater has the right number of counts of items. Again, if you've done JavaScript for a while, you should be saying, hey, wait a minute, you can't do that. There should be a callback because when I push the fetch button, the code has to go talk to the server and there's a delay before the next step happens. So what happened to the callback? So callbacks are super cool in JavaScript and it would kind of allows all this asynchronity to happen given that you have a single thread. But it also could be kind of troublesome to write code in this particular way. And so what we wanted to make sure that the the end-to-end -end testing framework was able to take this thing into account. Uh, so what happens in here is that this thing obviously gets executed synchronously and it builds up an internal uh, state machine that basically says, this is the transitions I have to do in order to run the test. And then these transitions are very asynchronous in nature so that they can click on the button and then wait appropriate amount of time before the next step runs. And so the next question becomes, well, how much time is the appropriate amount of time? You don't want to be pulling. That's something that, like, for example, Selenium always does and that's source of flakiness. So it turns out that this uh, uh, test runner is very intimate with the framework. And so it knows how to hook it and say, let me know when there's outstanding XHR requires. Let me know when you're in the middle of painting or whatever, so that when the code is done uh, executing what it needs to do, notify me so that I can go and execute the next step in the test sequence. Uh, and what that allows us to do is to have a very uh, synchronous looking test, but in reality, they execute asynchronously and uh, they never have to wait for anything. So there's no pulling going on. It's all event driven. And as a result, the tests are super fast, you know, as fast as possible, but not faster because it'd be too, too quick. And they're not doing any pulling, so they're not kind of just waiting there. Um, so testability, I think, is super important. And so let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, actually, we're kind of coming to an end. Do you have any questions so far? Yes? On your uh, defer, is your dependency injection framework expected to use for any method that function is there? Yes, that is very good. OK, so let's talk about that. Uh, I don't know where it, so let's talk about defer. Here we go. Uh, let's see if there's a good example in here. I don't have an example in here, but uh, let's go back to uh, Let's go here. There's an example here. So here's a buzz controller, and it takes a resource. And there's two ways to do it. One is to actually specify dollar inject, and then specify what you want to inject into it. That way, you can run it through a minification system and not worry about losing it. Uh, but if you're not going to do it through, if you're not going to just want to hack around, then you can skip the dollar inject, and then we'll introspect the method signature by doing two string on a function. I know it sounds crazy, uh, and we automatically figure out what the parameters are. So we're just kind of scratching the surface here, but an excellent question. Any other ones? All right. Um, so I want to show you a little more about, uh, oops, that's not the right one. So JavaScript, right? Testing. Do I have to convince you that testing is important in JavaScript? Yes, no? <laughs> you guys all know it's important, right? So the issue is, right, if you click on a button, so here in this case we have a control that says error, we call a method greet, and then I called alert on this instead of on a window, right? And so this caused an exception to happen. Uh, there's no way to know that this is not a valid code unless you have tests that you can execute all the time. And so testability is an important thing. And it, the thing about it is that the bigger your project is, the more important the testability becomes because your velocity of it decreases. So uh, what's, what makes testability important is that you have to make it easy to write the test, easy to run the test, and, and have the environment to go with it. And this is non-trivial stuff to do. Um, so let's do a simple example here. Here's a uh, password generator that as I type my password, it, bec it basically labels it whether it's strong, medium, or, uh, or weak. And I can also ask the server to auto-generate a random password for me. This is a typical jQuery style piece of code. And from a testability uh, point of view, this is troublesome for several reasons. First of all, this, this anonymous global function basically prevents me from ever uh, testing it because the code will execute before I have a chance to do any setup. So the first thing one has to do is to refactor the code by pulling out the, the main method, so to speak, and then preventing the default run on to happen. 
Uh, the next thing is, if you wanted to write a test, I'm using Jasmine over here. I think somebody mentioned Jasmine yesterday in the talks. By the way, awesome library for testability if you're interested, for testing, so not testability. What I have to do is I have to create the right kind of DOM elements so that the tests further on can get a hold of these DOM elements and can perform operations. And the more complicated the UI becomes, the harder this becomes. And so the testability really suffers from a unit point of view uh, on it. And the reason why this is hard is because DOM is essentially a global variable. And global variables suck in terms of a lot of different reasons. And one of them is testability. So the same exact piece of code in Angular, first of all, the code is much shorter because you don't have to get a hold of these things. But more importantly, the tests are way shorter because uh, we can just instantiate our controller. We can just assign values to the model. And then we can assert that the right UI events have happened. And we're just trusting that the framework will properly render the right stuff. Uh, but we could still make a mistake in your uh, directives inside of your HTML. For, for that reason, you need to have end-to-end -end test suite. So this is the end-to-end -end test suite. And as I, uh, let's see. And this is actually going to execute the same exact demo. And I put wait statements inside of it so that you can see that you know, the first step is enter some code in it. Uh, then you can see that the code was inserted in here. Uh, then it's a, you know, a, a, a assert that the display was on in a particular way. Then enter some more stuff and so on, and then run the next step um, here. So what's interesting about it is if you look at the code is that I actually put wait statements in here, right? Again, something that not, is not possible with JavaScript because JavaScript is asynchronous. So there's no way to block. But we kind of trick, trick the code into building an internal data structure, which we execute then later on, to give you this ability to sequentially produce the steps you want and at the same time being allowed to create wait statements in there. Uh, so for unit testing, we use something called JavaScript test driver. How many of you guys heard of that? Awesome. Uh, and for end-to-end -end testing, we have this thing plus Jasmine. Uh, we kind of mentioned all of the other pieces. Oh, yeah. One thing I didn't mention here is that when we do uh, testing, so this demo here was doing XHR. When I click on generate, it went and fetched some data. What's cool about it is that inside of the test, when you put the whole thing together, notice what I can do in there. I do, here it is. Uh, I get a hold of the browser through dependency injection, and then I create an expectation. I say, hey, expect to get an a JSON request on a specific URL, and then respond with you know, object that is password ABC123. I can call the generate method, which is the same thing as clicking on the generate button, and then I can expect that the password isn't set because the callback hasn't happened yet, right? So I expect that the password isn't set. Then I print emulate that the callback is happening at this point, and then I uh, assert that the password is now set to what the JSON was supposed to do. So not only, uh, you know, this is important because you want it to have these kinds of tests, these kinds of unit tests, and so you need a way to mock out the system, and you need to have a way to easily replace these pieces uh, to get there. Uh, and I think I'm also about to, uh, out of time. Uh, yep, but that's basically it. So questions? So um, how does it play with Sencha? So Sencha, uh, I've never used Sencha, so hopefully I won't misspoke here, misspeak here. But to my understanding is Sencha has some amazing widgets. And it's also a higher level. Like, so you don't code against HTML. You code against the API, which then generates the HTML. Right? So this is the, basically the level of removed that instead of embracing the HTML, you're saying, well, HTML and CSS is something we're going to hide from you, which has its merits for certain things. But sometimes that's not what you want to do. So, so for Sencha, what you would like to do is you would want to wrap these components that they have into something that's equivalent in Angular. So Sencha probably has something called a tab. So it'd be super cool if somebody did the glue logic that basically tells Angular that whenever it comes across something called, let's call it Sencha S namespace, so S colon tab, to go and instantiate the Sencha tab component and put it right here inside of the HTML. So in this way, you know, Angular doesn't want to be your widget library. There's lots and lots of existing widget libraries that do a fantastic job at it. But 
if you if somebody would write glue code in there, what it would allow you to do is to have HTML and it have declarative way of instantiating these components. The next difference is uh, libraries like um, Sprout Core, uh, and, and I believe, although I haven't used uh, Backbone and Knockout.js, they force you to wrap your model in kind of proxy objects. And so every time you want to access the data or the value, you go through this proxy object, and that lets them know whenever you modify the object. So the big difference with Angular is it makes, you know, I said it's not a library because it doesn't make you call anything, and it's not a framework in the sense it doesn't call you either. So the big difference is the objects you work with are plain old Java objects. So when I give you an array and then I data bind to the array later on, it's not a some kind of an object that wraps an array that kind of listens to events and mutations on it. It's an actual JavaScript array. And it doesn't matter where the, the array came from, your XHR or my XHR, or from Sanchez or J jQuery or whatever. It's just an array. So as long as you put it inside of the model, uh, Angular will figure out, oh, this array has changed, and I need to go update the, the UI. So that's kind of the other major difference. And, and because it doesn't force you to uh, implement anything or doesn't force you to wrap your objects, it's very, uh, it's very compatible with the other libraries so that you can just glue them together. Good question. Well, thank you, guys. If you, if you wanted to chat more about it, I'll be hanging out over here. And uh, I'm happy to show you some more demos of what, what is possible uh, with this thing. See you.